Well, let's talk a little while about something we don't talk about a lot. Bet your money you don't talk about this a whole lot. How long has it been when you sat down with somebody and said, I want to talk to you about my prayer life? It's quiet, doesn't it? Huh? Ooh, you have made big conversations about that for some time. Let's talk a little bit about our prayer life. And let's do it by, by going to the Old Testament. I, I've been kind of having fun this summer, hanging out in the Old Testament for a while and, and coming up and doing some of these, these messages that tie in so neatly. And there's a guy that those of us that went to men's conference in 95 met Jack Modisette. And Jack preached to us about Elijah for the weekend. It was, it was powerhouse. And he's got another series he's working on now. He'll be there next February with us. And he told me he can't wait for the calendar to get to the last weekend of February because he's excited about coming and laying out the truth. And, and if you have any sense at all, you'll get to that conference. I think we're going to have guys sleeping down in the ditch and in motor homes and everywhere else because I think we're going to overrun that camp. I'm going to be terribly disappointed if we don't have more people than we know what to do with at that camp because of those great messages on Elijah. See, when we meet Elijah, it's in 1 Kings chapter 17. And he kind of bursts into the chambers of King Ahab and he makes this statement. As surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, the God whom I worship and serve, there won't be any dew or rain for several years until I say the word. <laughs> Turns on his heel and away he goes. And you know that if he went to see King Ahab... He had somebody that stuck so close to him and made most of the decisions. Her name was Queen Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel kind of remind me of a current situation of a husband-wife team in major responsibility. You may not get that same picture, but that's one I have, that uh, she was really the, the bad news in the bunch as you read the scriptures and find out. But he made that statement, and off he left. Now, let me make two statements to you. One is the greatest blessing for an unconverted sinner, and that may be who you are. You have never come to the place of conversion that Jeff and Terry were talking about in their testimony. You've never come to where you've acknowledged Jesus Christ is the Son of God and asked him to become your Savior. The greatest blessing in your life is to receive Christ as your Savior. But having done that, once we are saved, the highest honor is to be used by Christ in the saving and blessing of other people. And that isn't going to happen unless we become the kind of people that understand something about prayer. Prayer is the coupling link between human need and divine power. It's not just a meaningless exercise. It's the coupling link. If that is not there, there can be all the human need in the world and all the divine power that can meet any need, and they never hook up without prayer. Prayer creates the opportunity for God's grace and power to work in men and women. And that's why I ask you, you ever think about what's going on in your prayer life? Because here, this... Elijah feller that we meet in 1 Kings 17, when we go to James chapter 5, verses 16, 17, and 18, we have a wonderful picture of this man. And here's what it says, James 5, 16. The earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and wonderful results. You consider yourself a righteous man? Tell me what great power and wonderful results are happening because you pray. Here comes the illustration. Elijah was as completely human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for the next three and a half years. And then he prayed again, this time that it would rain. And down it poured, and the grass turned green, and the gardens began to grow again. Key statement, Elijah was as completely human as we are. Now, when we see Elijah the prophet. We see him in these unusual circumstances, gutsy things that he does. For instance, making this announcement, three and a half years later, he comes back and says, okay, we'll have a contest. 
We'll find out whose God is real. You're worshiping these phony gods. I say they're phony. You say they're real. Let's have a contest. And that's that great story at Mount Carmel. They gathered there for the contest. He said, set up your altar, do your thing, put the animal on it, and then begin to pray. And then when you finish, I'll do the same thing. And the God that answers by fire, that's the real God. And so they got busy. They set up the altar. They brought 450 prophets of Baal, this heathen God. I'm sure they had a huge crowd up there. Uh, one of the key thrills in going to Israel last year was to stand on Mount Carmel and think about Elijah and think about how these prophets of Baal had spent all morning praying and yelling and hollering and crying and cutting themselves. And Elijah became what we call in sports a bench jockey. You know, a bench jockey is a guy who knows how to ride the other team. You know that, don't you, Harris? You know about bench jockeys. They call it trash talking now, a lot, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff. But here's old Elijah. He's over there watching these guys do their thing, and he makes a few statements to them. He said, uh, you'll have to shout a little louder than that, fellas. Uh, after all, uh, your God may be talking to someone else, and you can't interrupt him. Or he may be out sitting on the toilet. That's right here, 1 Kings chapter 18. Don't look at me like that and say it doesn't say it. Yes, it does. Yeah, he's in the outhouse. You've got to yell a little louder. Or maybe he's away on a trip. Or maybe he's asleep and needs to be wakened. Just really gigging them concerning this God they're praying to that can't do anything. And they finally get through and he sets up his altar. He says, give me four barrels of water to pour over this thing. It hasn't rained in three and a half years. They find four barrels. He said, give me four more. I want to make sure nobody knows I'm using a little gimmick on this deal. Give me four more. He's got 12 barrels of water poured over this thing. He's got a trench around it full of water. And he gets down to pray. Now listen to this. O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel... These are a bunch of Israelis that are out there that have gone chasing after false gods and worshiping the wrong thing. Prove today that you are the God of Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I've done all this at your command. Oh, Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you are God and that you brought them back to yourself. People, the one prime responsibility we carry is to demonstrate the power of God so that others will say, yes, that is truly the Lord God of the universe, and I will worship him. There are many gods. There is one true God. And his son, Jesus Christ, is the mediator between God and man. He's saying the same thing here. There's one true God. God, answer me for this reason, not so that I get lifted up to say, whoa, Elijah is something else. Answer me for this one reason, so that the people will know that you are God and you brought them back to yourself. And the fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the bull and the wood and the stones and the dust and evaporate all the water in the ditch. And when people saw it, they said, Jehovah is God. Jehovah is God. No, Elijah said, don't let one of those 450 prophets of Baal escape. These lousy, lying beggars have been deceiving these people long enough. I will personally kill every one of them. And he did. See, you get off on that little track. Oh, it's such a bloody thing. My, this shouldn't be in the Bible. Hey, look, God says there is one way. He's very one way about there being one way. He seized them all and killed them. And Elijah said, go and enjoy a good meal, Ahab, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Now, when you get over here to, to James chapter 5, he was as completely human as we were. Hey, God gives us a picture of this same fellow sitting under a juniper bush at another point in his ministry and saying, Lord, I'm the only one left. Just go ahead and kill me. How is it that a guy can stand on Mount Carmel and do toe-to-toe -to -toe combat with 450 guys, wind up butchering them, 
and then find himself parked under a juniper bush saying, Lord, I'm just, I'm just a wipeout. Just finish me off, Lord. Just let me die. I'm the only one left. And God just kind of, you know, just kind of verbally slapped him around, you know, just, wake up. I got 7,000 people that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Don't act like you're so hot that you're the only one. See, God lets us see that picture of how human that he was. Remember something. The person of prayer, that strong intercessory prayer, that person of prayer is the person of power. When I said to you to start with, Let's talk about our prayer life. How many discussions have you had recently about your prayer life? It got pretty quiet in here. Why? Because we don't have much to report. Don't have much to report. No power. Oh, we come to church every week. We put a little something in the box. Taking care to discover the joy. Even teaching a little bit now and again. Getting ready to do five days of fun, getting our kids signed up. Even signed up myself to teach a little. No power. Action, busy work, but no power. Do you ever stop to assess, does this thing work? Or you just kind of rotely move along down the road, I'm a Christian and not expect anything to happen. And some have been living so long with the notion that nothing's going to happen, nothing has happened, nothing's going to happen. Why? Because you will not become that person of strong intercessory prayer on behalf of people and situations. Secondly, it says he prayed earnestly. We aren't told that in 1 Kings 17. We just see this brash prophet coming in. We don't see him as a man who had been somewhere with the Lord and praying earnestly and thinking about the condition of the people, thinking about how far off base they were and they were worshiping all the wrong idols. He prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. God must bring some judgment on these people, cut off the water. No dew, no rain, no nothing. And let's see if that brings them around. See, I believe that prayer in relation to natural forces works. I believe that God still answers by commanding nature to do his bidding, just like he did when Jesus stood up in the boat and said, peace be still. Wind, knock it off. Waves, calm down. I think God is still in charge of the forces of nature, but I don't believe that we believe that. Question, how much time have you spent on your knees on behalf of the people in Oklahoma and Texas that are starving, they have no crop, they're losing their land, they're losing farms that have been in their families for generations. How much time have you spent on your knees on their behalf that rain would fall? Zip. We watch the news and watch some farmer kicking the clod and the dust flying. We say, boy, that's really too bad. And we go to something else that's more pleasant. We're not concerned about the folks in Oklahoma and Texas. We're not concerned about the folks around the world because our concerns are so on ourselves that we haven't got time to be concerned about a world that needs to know Jesus Christ, let alone a world that needs some rain, and we can participate in that thing. I recall right here in this valley a couple of three years ago when we were struggling for lack of water, and God's people began to pray in this valley like they had not prayed before. When suddenly it dawns on you that we're in economic difficulty if something good doesn't happen here shortly, we begin to pray. We had water we didn't know what to do with. See, I believe that we still are in a situation where if we will come earnestly before the Lord, we'll see it pour. We will see the forces of nature change. And behind this fiery public champion is a humble intercessor that knows what it is to be alone with God and talk to God. 
Whatever your public image may be, my question is, what are you privately? Do you and God have a thing going where you are really talking to him about situations and people that need your prayer? See, when Jesus prayed, Scripture tells us in Hebrews 5, 7, while Christ was here on earth, he pleaded with God, praying with tears and agony of soul to the only one who could save him from premature death. Satan wanted to take him out early. Satan wanted to kill him in the garden, sweating great drops of blood. He wanted to do anything except let him get on a cross and die. And Jesus prayed earnestly with agony of soul and tears. And God heard his prayer because of his strong desire to obey God at all times. You see, the, the little touch points there that are key is your desire to obey God at all times? You know, there's some of you in this place that have never been in this baptistry. You've made, you've made profession of faith in Christ. You think about baptism, well, I'm okay, I know I'm saved. And you refuse to obey God by coming and saying, I need to be baptized. Scary? Terry and Jeff said to me, boy, as we're coming down the hall, ooh, I'm getting scared now. I said, okay, we'll make it. And some of you just keep digging your heels in. And yet you tell me what a great Christian you are. You got your heels dug in on money. You got your heels dug in on obedience in any form, except you go through this routine of showing up. The key thing, and if Jesus needed this, learn what it was to obey his father, and he had that strong desire to obey God, his father, at all times, then I can do no less. And you can do no less. Prayed again. Rain came. See, we ought to lay out our situations before God, our personal, our church, our city, our county, our nation before God in prayer regularly. I'm afraid our prayer is pretty weak. Thirdly, verse 16, the earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and wonderful results. You see, that was true under the old covenant. Just think how much more true it is for those of us who live under the new covenant. We've got more ready access. We've got more ready power. I love living on this side of the cross. I don't know about you, but I love living on this side of the cross. And I'm grateful for that. And I'll tell you what, few believers are involved in prayer warfare. A couple of weeks ago, the assignment was Ephesians chapter 6, get on the armor. When you've got on the armor and you're all suited up, you come to verse 18 and it says, pray all the time. Pray all the time. Ask God for anything in line with the Holy Spirit's wishes. Plead with him, reminding him of your needs and keep praying earnestly for all Christians everywhere. Suiting up and not doing this is some kind of phony deal. Get on the armor and commence to pray because the powers is God's, not ours. And he says, I want to run that power through you. I want to make this one thing very clear. There is a tremendous difference between prayer concerning natural forces and prayer concerning human beings. You see... The wind doesn't have a mind of its own. God controls that. The rain doesn't have a mind of its own. God controls that. But he did something with us human beings. He gave us freedom of choice. We can choose to tell God to take a hike. There might be some of you here. Somehow you're in this place. You're not sure why you're here. You kind of It's kind of a kick. You don't know what music's going to happen. And you don't know when the preacher's going to sing. You don't know all these kinds of things. You kind of show up, keep showing up. But you've never come to the place of saying, I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. You're exercising your human will. I stood recently in the home of Jerry and Marlene Verner. And as I was about to leave, the three of us were standing there by the front door, and I was about to pray. And he said, before you pray, I want to say something. And this man is kind of a stoic. But the tears began to run down his face. 
He said, I want to thank both of you for not giving up on me. You, for more than 20 years, you've prayed for me. He said, Marlene, for 38 years, you've prayed that I would come to Christ. And I've finally made the step of putting my faith in Christ as my Savior. See, I believe that if we keep knocking on that door on behalf of people, I believe that God will bring power to bear that will cause them to make that move. But we don't have the right to grow weary and quit. My question to you is this. Will you commit to prayer for God's power on people? I love the little poem that Tennyson wrote. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, see, a lot of us have heard that part. We haven't heard the rest. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day. For what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain? If, knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer both for themselves and those who call them friend. That's powerful. One more time. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me day and night. For what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain? If, knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer both for themselves and those who call them friend. Stand with me, let's pray. I trust you'll read John 17 every day. And talk to God about your prayer life and talk to God about the things you're not willing to be obedient in and make some moves that will bring delight and joy to your life. Even that move to put Christ as your Savior. Father, we go from here grateful for the privilege to open the book. Grateful that you have blessed us with such an opportunity. And as we read John 17 and think that your son took time to pray for us in 1996, concerned about us, concerned about our walk, concerned about whether or not there's anything wonderful happening because we're your children. God, move on us in great power, I pray, and accomplish your purpose in us. We would just pray for those folks in Oklahoma. And I pray that some of our people will get on their knees on behalf of those people they don't even know and hammer away at the heavens until the rain begins to fall. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Good to be with you.